uh, you really don't have the early church writers uh, making the definitive dogmatic statements that you see going on today. Uh, in fact, there's only two pages of commentary in the 2,000 pages that, that the early church fathers uh, wrote on uh, Genesis 1, only two pages that deal uh, with the uh, length issue, and they're quite vague. The first specific statement you get in the uh, literature is from Isaac Newton, and uh, he, d- he comes out strongly on the old earth perspective. So that's the first time in history, and incidentally, that's before evolution even uh, raised its ear. Uh, more than uh, 300 years ago, you got Isaac Newton uh, making uh, that uh, particular statement. But I would strongly dispute the idea that Job and Psalms and Proverbs are not creation accounts. If you look at Job 38 and 39, the entire two chapters are dealing uh, with creation. They actually address events on all six creation days. Psalm 104 has been recognized for centuries as a creation psalm. And there are actually several creation psalms. In Psalm 104, the entire psalm uh, deals with uh, creation history. All right, so let, so let me stop you right there. It's critical to integrate. Oh, no, no, I understand. So, Jason, your rebuttal to that. Well, okay, Psalm 104 is not an account at all. It's, written in, uh, it's not written in the historic narrative style. Rather, it's written in a poetic way. And that's something that Dr. Stephen Boyd, a Ph.D. A Hebrew scholar at the Master's College, has confirmed. The way the literature is arranged is not, uh, it's not something that is historical narrative. Now, it certainly references creation a number of times. That's fine. If I went out tonight and I said, boy, the moon, you know, maybe, maybe the moon's really pretty tonight, and I said, boy, look at the moon which God created. Am I referencing creation? Yes. Is that a creation account? No. Because, you see, I'm living in the present, and I'm looking at the moon in the present, and I'm uh, pointing out that uh, God created it in the past. Now, Psalm 104 very clearly is not a creation account because it refers to things that exist in the modern world. For example, if you look at Psalm 104, verse 26, it talks about, it says there are ships moving along. Mm. Now, is that referring to uh, creation? Were there ships moving along at creation? Clearly not. And so this is talking about how, how God cares for the present world. By the way, the word creation can mean, to, it can mean, it can refer to the creation week, or it can refer to what God has created. For example, if I made a beautiful sculpture, and I said, come and take a look at my creation, I'm not referring to the act of me creating, I'm referring to what I created. Psalm okay. 104 is praising God for his creation, what he has made, and there are references to, to the beginning. But that's not what the psalm is entirely about, and you can see examples of that throughout. In fact, it talks about the lions roaring after their prey. All right, well, Jason, um, let me interrupt because we've got to take a break. We're going to come back, and uh, we're going to continue this discussion between Drs. Hugh Ross and Jason Lyle in something I'm calling Thousands or Billions. It deals with the age of the Earth and the age of the cosmos. And what I think is fascinating is they're both astrophysicists, and we went immediately to the text in understanding what the Hebrew word yom, Y-O-M, uh, what that means. Is it a literal 24-hour period, or does it have other meanings? And they differed on the different, quote, creation accounts. According to Dr. Ross, there are a number of creation accounts in the Scripture. According to Dr. Jason Lyle, there's only one in the book of Genesis. The other ones refer to creation, but not the act of creation. Interesting distinction. We continue we'll continue. Debate. There's more ahead, a lot more thousands as we continue. Or billion. And joining us are Drs. Hugh Ross and Jason Lyle. Hugh 25. Ross, founder and president of Reasons to Believe. And Jason Lyle is with Ken Ham's Answers in Genesis out of Cincinnati. Both PhDs in astrophysics. Both love the Lord. Both believe in biblical inerrancy. Uh, they're not, you know, theological liberals or anything like that. They're both hostile to evolution. Uh, but they disagree strongly on the age of the earth and the age of the cosmos. Jason, uh, we had started with you on the, in the previous segment. So, Dr. Ross, we're going to start this time with you. Here's the question. In the previous segment, we spent almost the whole time talking about Hebrew. Yet you're both astrophysicists, and so I want to get in your strong suit, which is dealing with your field of study and expertise, which is, of course, astronomy. So, Hugh, when you look through a telescope, uh, what do you see? Do you see thousands or millions or billions of years in the distances between galaxies and stars and all that kind of stuff? Because I think most people just want to understand, okay, what do you see when you look through? My hunch is... You see billions, and Jason sees thousands, but I don't know why. So what do you see, Hugh, when you look through a telescope? You see thousands or billions? Well, just to wrap up on the last section, uh, if you go to our reasons.org website, we give you every verse in the Bible that deals with creation. We recommend that people read all those before they make up our mind. But, you know, Jason and I agree on a lot of things. We both agree that the Bible teaches that the universe has continuously expanded from a cosmic creation event an actual beginning of matter, energy, space, and time. 
The Bible also teaches that the laws of physics are constant and uniform. Now, if such a universe has expanded for only thousands of years, gas would disperse so quickly that stars would never form. On the other hand, if such a universe has expanded for quadrillions of years or more, all stars would be black holes or neutron stars. Only in such a universe that is billions of years old can a star like the sun and a planet like Earth exist. So since I see stars and planets, I'm persuaded that indeed the universe must be billions of years old. And also, if the universe is only thousands of years old, we wouldn't see any burnt-out stars. Uh, there'd be no large supernova remnants, and we see an abundance of both. All right, so Hugh, when you look through, you see a whole bunch of age. You see billions of years, right? Right. Okay, right. So, so Jason... When you look through a telescope, do you see billions of years or do you see thousands? I mean, uh, what do you see when you look through a telescope? I see a universe that was supernaturally created by God thousands of years ago. I think the evidence is very consistent with that. And, uh, of course, I will um, you know, encourage people to, to understand that this issue is largely determined by your worldview. You're, you can think of that like mental glasses. The reason we see different things when we look at the same universe is that we're wearing different mental glasses, as it were. And I can temporarily take off my uh, my biblical creation glasses and put on my, my Hugh Ross glasses and take a look at the universe from the perspective of millions of years, and I can understand why he draws the conclusions that he does. But my point is, if I start from a straightforward reading of Scripture and I look at the universe, I find it's very consistent. And, uh, you know, there are lots of scientific arguments. Maybe we'll get into some of those a little bit later. But, but, but Jason, hold on. Let me, let me stop you there for a second. Yeah. But the way that people have come to Christ throughout most of history has not been to have the Bible first— I mean, what about the argument from general revelation? I mean, I was an atheist for 27 years. I, I didn't, quote, get the Bible first and then look at the sky. I was looking at the sky going, oh, wow, there must be a creator. It was that kind of thing. And what you're saying is I've got to have the Bible to understand what I'm seeing right. But the reality is a lot of people are looking either, you know, at, through a microscope or and seeing design in a cell, or they're looking at the sky and saying, oh, my gosh, there's got to be a creator, right? Well, you know, God gives everyone some grace to be able to understand things and to, and to be able to understand Him. God makes it very clear that He has revealed Himself to all people through nature. So there is something to general revelation. That's fine. But revelation, general revelation, doesn't tell us as much as what I think uh, some, some people would like to pull from it. I, I'd say general revelation tells us three things. It tells us that there is a God, and in particular the biblical God. It tells us his righteous standards, that is, there's a certain standards of behavior that are hardwired into us. And three, it tells us that we cannot live up to God's standard, and therefore we're deserving of God's wrath. And I can support all those with uh, scriptures, particularly in the Romans. All it, right, but it, Jason, it, hold on. We, we, you went, in the very beginning, you said, I see thousands of years supernaturally created by God. I think every Christian would agree with you. But the problem, well, not on the thousands part, but certainly on the, the creation part. But here's the problem for me is when you see the distance bes between different galaxies, do you you know, they may say it's, you know, it's 100 million light years. Do you translate that into, I don't know, certain thousands of years? Are the distances wrong? The distances, I think, are right. I think there's good scientific reasons to believe that those distances are vast. But you see, just because something is very big doesn't necessarily mean that it's very old. God certainly has the power to create a very, very big universe. I think you and I would agree that God has the power to create it instantaneously. The question is, how did he do it? And I would argue that he did it the way he says he did it in the scriptures, and that uh, it's very clear that he created in six days. But, but uh, and Hugh, let me go back to you on this one. But it is expanding. You both agree with an, an expanding universe. I think the evidence is overwhelmingly clear on that. But if you just wind it back, if it's expanding at a certain rate now and you just wind the clock back, it's more than thousands of years, right? Well, that's right. I mean, uh, if the universe's age is going to be its present size divided by the expansion rate, and to sustain a young date, one must prove that the universe is a million times smaller, uh, which Jason uh, says that's not the case, or the expansion rate is a million times faster, or clocks are running a million times faster in the distant universe. And those are all things astronomers can check. Also, it's something you can check by going to the Bible. The Bible repeatedly tells us that the laws of physics don't change. So there's no change in the laws of physics, and indeed the universe must be billions of years old.
Jason, one of the things that young Earth uh, astronomers often say is that maybe the speed of light has changed or that, you know, God created the whole thing, uh, you know, with the appearance of age, etc. But what about, you know, the black holes and what about the apparent millions or billions of years of age that's out there? Did God create black holes uh, 